In 1964, Caltech physicist Richard Feynman asked a simple question in one of his now legendary lectures. Is it true, he asked, is the actual physical three-dimensional space we live in curved? He wasn't questioning the great pillar of Einstein's general theory of relativity, curved space-time. He was simply noting how hard it was for the human mind to accept that space itself might curve in response to what another great theorist, John Wheeler of Princeton, called the crushing imperative of gravity. We know that space-time is curved. Our GPS-linked cell phones couldn't accurately tell us where we are without taking into account that the space where its satellite's orbit is in fact curved by its proximity to the Earth. But physicists have long known that the marriage of curved space and the crushing imperative of gravity hinted there were bizarre and terrifying realms of the universe where gravity crushed even space itself, crushed space, crushed light, crushed time itself. Kip Thorne calls this the warped side of the universe. On September 14th, 2015, we experienced the warped side for the first time when LIGO detected a faint wave of curved space pass through its two detectors. In that one moment, Northwestern University LIGO astrophysicist Vicki Calogera wrote, a new window of cosmic exploration was fully opened and a brand new field of astronomy was realized. 25 years earlier, John Wheeler had predicted that the era of gravitational wave astronomy would be, in his words, an unsurpassable window into cataclysmic events. Until now, we have only seen warped space-time. We as scientists have only seen warped space-time, but it's very calm. As though we'd only seen the surface of the ocean on a very calm day when it's quite glassy. We had never seen the ocean roiled in a storm with crashing waves. All of that changed on September 14. The colliding black holes that produced these gravitational waves created a violent storm in the fabric of space and time. Now the storm was brief, 20 milliseconds, very brief, but very powerful. The total power output in the gravitational waves during the brief collision was 50 times greater than all of the power put out by all of the stars in the universe put together. It's unbelievable, 50 times the power of all the stars in the universe put together. Because it was so brief, the total energy was not that big, it was only what you would get by taking three suns, annihilating them, and putting them into gravitational waves. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of a lot. <laughs> Even though we're used to reading about, say, newspapers, you know, black hole discovered at the center of some galaxy or whatever, it doesn't even appear on the front page anymore. Um, really, that's not true. What astronomers have been able to tell us is there are places in the universe where there's a lot of matter in a small volume. If general relativity is correct, then these are black holes. But we don't have, or we haven't had any independent measurement that the space and time in the neighborhood of these regions is warped in this bizarre way that Einstein has predicted. The only way to test that with absolute certainty is to get some kind of a signal that comes from that strong field curved region of space and time that we can measure far away. And that's the gravitational wave. The wonderful thing about the interferometers is that, especially in the situation where the signal was as loud as it was, you could tell not only that there was a signal, that it was real, but that it had come from two black holes, one of 36 solar masses and one of 29 solar masses, and that the evolution of their orbits obeyed what the prediction was from the general theory of relativity. I mean, it was such a fantastically complete story on its own merits, just that the data told us that, you know, A, it's a wonderful thing, and it, it made it believable. From each of these sources, we can learn something different about the universe, about 
nuclear matter in extreme condition, general relativity, and so on and so forth. So when this happens, I, I think the most important uh, you know, fact will be the transition between uh, finding gravitational waves, which is what we are doing now, what people have rightly focused on, on, on the last several years, okay? To, so from finding gravitational waves to doing something with gravitational waves, which is the exciting part, okay? The next time we have a galactic supernova and when we detect the galactic supernova with advanced LIGO, we're going to be able to finally learn how core collapse supernovae explode. The only information you can actually get from the explosion, from observing in light, is secondhand. By observing them in gravitational waves, which are emitted from the very center of the explosion, you can determine how the explosion is actually happening. It's how I imagine uh, getting out of the moon lander and setting foot on the moon for the first time. And knowing that we got to this thanks to the work of many brilliant, brilliant scientists that, you know, over the course of these 100 years, came up with this crazy theory of space-time stretching and squeezing. They built what was an unbelievable detector that has this incredible accuracy. And other scientists who analyzed the data and pulled out the signal out of all the noise all these challenges that have been fought, all these people that have put so much into it, and there we are. So the work I've been doing so far deals with continuous gravitational waves, and these are waves that are always on, like their name says. These waves are very faint, but they are on constantly, and that helps us accumulate data and see them better over time. These waves are produced by uh, the main candidate is neutron stars, which are a compact object, maybe the size of Pasadena, but the whole mass of the sun in that volume. So it's an extremely dense, extremely exotic kind of matter where you don't have atoms anymore. You don't have the usual molecules that we're used to, which is a very exotic thing. We don't really understand. We can use those waves to actually learn something about those exotic states of matter. This is really a fantastic opportunity to see into the heart of the most dense regions of the universe that aren't observable in light. LIGO was not just the discovery of gravitational waves, big enough, but it was also the first direct observation of black holes that were, oh, perhaps three to ten times heavier than anybody had expected. So it was really, uh, really spectacular, and it is I believe the beginning of a new era of astronomy and astrophysics and even cosmology. The ultimate holy grail of gravitational wave astronomy is probing the Big Bang. Gravitational waves are the only form of radiation that is so penetrating that it would travel unscathed through the very, very hot and dense material in the earliest fraction of a second of the life of the universe. So if we are ever going to actually see the Big Bang, the only way we will, act, we will actually see it is through gravitational waves. To see this uh, signal from the early universe uh, will be certainly the greatest discovery ever, because we'll bring back a snapshot of the universe at very, very early time, at a time much earlier than when uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation was emitted that today we measure very well. That was emitted 300,000 years after the Big Bang. These gravitational waves are produced basically in a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And so we will have a snapshot of what the universe was at that time. All of us are fascinated by what might be out there. And there's a great allure in finding something that you hadn't expected at all. So we hope to be online during some event, which is very, very difficult to explain and, and drive theorists in a new way. In the era when we were trying to convince people that LIGO should be built, for me, this was the most exciting thing, is the likelihood that we will see waves from phenomena that we never dreamed of. After all, every time a new window has been opened on the universe, unexpected things have been seen, and this will surely not be an exception. It was 400 years ago that Galileo created modern electromagnetic astronomy 
by turning a small optic telescope on the sky and discovering the moons of Jupiter. It was two years ago that this wonderful LIGO-Virgo collaboration turned on the advanced detectors, the advanced LIGO detectors, and saw the gravitational waves from collisions of two black holes. In those 400 years since Galileo, we have learned so much about the universe with optical astronomy. Our understanding of the universe is so different today than it was 400 years ago, thanks to optical astronomy. What might be the future 400 years from now when we have 400 years in our pockets of gravitational astronomy together with electromagnetic astronomy? I think the uh, future is really very, very exciting. I joined the collaboration in 2010, um, which was just before the detectors um, shut down, before um, being made into advanced LIGO. And um, one thing I got a lot from um, astronomer friends was, oh, you're never going to see anything, and you know, it's a waste of time. But I mean, it's really cool. Why, if, if there is a chance of detecting these things, then why on earth would you not work on it? I mean, I personally work on working out how giant stars explode when they die. And then looking, um, looking at that um, by the ripples in space time that a neutron star creates when it's formed. Why would you not work on it? I'm very much for the science that, you know, may not be a sure thing at the moment, but it's interesting and it matters and it's something, it's something that's important um, to look at, even though there might not be a payoff in the immediate future. When I came in, um, I was contemplating taking a year off and doing some more theoretical work in another area of physics. And Alan, my advisor, told me, but right now is the right moment. We're about to detect these waves. Like, you don't want to miss out. Like, one year could mean that you miss it all out. And I was like, well, okay, and I believed him, and I was like, okay. and in the end, he was right, right? If I had missed uh, this year, I, it would have been a year too late to be part of the whole excitement. But then I found out that people have been saying that <laughs> for 30 years. <laughs> so for 30 years, people were like, we're, we're going to detect it within the next year or so on. And <laughs> so it was funny that I finally came at the time when it was actually true. <laughs> so right place at the right time. Definitely, and it's extremely exciting looking forward to see what's about to come, especially, I think, for young people like us. It's, um, so it's a combination of, of years of work of a whole generation of scientists, but for us, it's the start of this whole new era of science. And so to be part of this historical moment, I think, is remarkable.